All right, today I am talking with Curtis Pernis, the uh, guitarist from the band Porn Orchard, which is an underground sort of noise rock grunge band active in Athens in the early 90s, late 80s. They put out a couple records on the CZ record label. Um, there's not much information about these guys. They're pretty underground, but uh, their music is really sick. You know, it's got a lot of different influences you can hear in it. So, um, yeah, let's start this off. How are you doing today, Curtis? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Enjoying the uh, fall weather that's hopefully coming fast. So, well, fall weather in Georgia is 85 degrees. It is, yeah, <laughs> for sure. No true fall, but uh, yeah. So I've been doing my interviews kind of in a chronological order. So um, I guess first off, I wanted to ask, what was one of the earliest you know moments where a song maybe kind of like struck a chord with you, or an or an album you remember your parents having as a kid that you really liked? And well, as a little kid. <clears throat> I guess I'd have to say I'm the youngest of five. Oh, okay. And uh, all my siblings, are, my older sister is 10 years older than me. And so people are significantly older than I am. And my sisters and my brother were always into music. And I remember as a little kid, uh, one of my sisters brought home the, the Bowie record, Ziggy Stardust. Uh, I think the first week that it was released because she was a big Bowie fan and nice. she would have been in high school and I would have been in first grade, I guess. And I loved that record. Uh, and I thought, I thought that record was a kid's record because it's so vivid with the imagery of the spaceships and all that kind of stuff. I thought, you know, it was kind of like maybe a Sesame street record or something like that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. So I love, I love that record a lot. And I, uh, just from the influence of my uh, siblings, I got to, they were really unique. I grew up in the middle of nowhere uh, in a small town in upstate New York. And my siblings are pretty unique that they always kind of sought out weird music. And so I got to hear Bowie and the Velvet Underground and my brother liked Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. And that all happened, you know, before I was in fourth grade. Cool. So I, think I, I was kind of prepared for a lot of weirder stuff just from having that early uh, exposure to things like that. That's awesome. So cool. Did uh, any of your siblings play music? No, they didn't. Well, my one of my sisters played clarinet <laughs> in this whole band, and that's really it. I remember maybe my oldest sister having an acoustic guitar around when I was a kid, but I don't think I ever really saw her play it. But I just remember it was under her bed. And I used to drag it out when she would leave the house when I was a little kid and I would kind of just try to play it. And that's really about, as far as my siblings playing music, that was really about it. Cool. That's awesome. How old were you when you started playing guitar then? I think I was about maybe 13 or 14. Like a lot of people my age, a lot of guys my age anyway, I was crazy about Kiss. And that was a my first rock band and all my friends and I listened to kiss and I started playing guitar because I really liked Ace Freely and I would play some uh, rock and Ace Freely solos. So I figured out some kiss songs on guitar and then I took a, took some lessons and we started a band before, probably before we even knew how to tune our instruments. Just because we thought, you know, you got to be in a band, you know, we just, we have to be the next, next kiss, you know, we were all 14 years old. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So that, that was the first band that we were all into besides stuff that was just kind of generally on the radio. Cool. So guitar was the first instrument you played or did you try anything before? I played a uh, trombone for a couple of years in a school band. And then I played I'm trying to think of the chronology of it would have, it would have been before because Kiss kind of ruined me for everything else. But I played drums in a marching band just briefly, maybe when I was 11. And I just, I know all those marching cadences, but you know, I can't sit down behind a set and play. And uh, those are the other two instruments that I played. Cool. That's awesome. So um, you mentioned that you kind of had like a band early on. Was that before Porn Orchard or was that eventually going you know, to become that band? Oh, no. We, no, that was way before that. We were all. That was me and just me and me and my high school buddies. Uh, yeah, so that would have been when we were all 14, 15, 16. And uh, then when I was I was kind of getting out of kiss, I was kind of 
I'll never forget that, you know, like I said, I grew up in a small town and all I could think about for maybe a year and a half of my life when I was around four, 13 and 14 was Kiss, you know, and uh, I had the chance to go see them in Montreal. And my dad drove me up there and bought me a scalp ticket outside the Montreal Forum, I think just because he was so sick of hearing about Kiss. <laughs> and uh, he sent me in by myself as a 14 year old kid and he went to see a movie. Uh, and it just blew my mind. I mean, finally seeing Kiss, you know, just like the biggest event of my life. And I got out of that show and probably talked about it all the way home. Uh, and then it was in the middle of the summer, it was August. And I woke up the next morning and the first thing I thought was, I'm too old for this. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. I can't go back to pining away for Kiss, you know. Mm -hmm. just, like I just had the sense that I had to move on. And mm -hmm. it was just a, a very, it was an interesting moment in my life at that time. Uh, but I'll say the next thing I have, so after having that kind of epiphany, uh, <clears throat> I was just listening to the radio maybe about six months later. And I used to listen to this, like I said, we were in the middle of nowhere, but we were able to get a uh, radio from Canada. And I used to listen to this radio station called Shea 106 from Ottawa. <clears throat> and they played really unique things. They would play things that you'd usually hear on the radio, like Zeppelin and kind of the hits of the day. But they would also play things that were coming out of England at the time, like Elvis Costello and just kind of more new wavy things. Uh, and one night they happened to play the Sex Pistols. And I don't think I'd ever even heard the the name of the band before but the music just came on and i just had this riveted just something about the way that it sounded and the way the guitar sounded and the way the lyrics were and that it just stunned me and i just stood there listening to it just waiting to hear who it was and the dj came back on and said it was the sex pistols uh and so that wiped everything that was kind of like the year zero for me you know kind of wiped everything else away and i just became fascinated with obsessed with punk rock after that that's awesome that's so cool yeah i know that record and then i think probably like the raw power or some that like yeah. I know people have said that like instantly flipped their tastes really quickly right. yeah it's, it's awesome. big it's the big bang moment for a lot of people you know mm -hmm. Totally. That's so cool. <laughs> awesome. So that was kind of like you're just transitioning to punk. How old were you been, I guess, when you first heard of them? 15. Yeah, I was 15. And uh, I I think I went to the drugstore the next day. They sold some records and harangued the person who worked there into ordering this record. And they finally found it like a month to get it in because nobody up there wanted it. <laughs> and I had it, you know, and just like I listened to it, I probably listened to it until the grooves were flat. That's and, so cool. Yeah. And from that, I got into, uh, I found some magazines that had mentioned the Sex Pistols. And uh, I mean, obviously, this is 1980 or something like that. There was no internet or anything. Mm -hmm. And I just found some magazines that mentioned the Sex Pistols and also mentioned bands like The Clash. And the buzzcocks and all that and i was able to find those records too after some searching around so i kind of got into all that stuff too that's awesome cool so when uh, i guess hardcore came around what did you think of that because it was kind of like a bit more abrasive more fast than the punk was coming out of england then i was i was two years behind on everything because <laughs> of where i was i didn't really have any friends that were into that kind of thing that could tell me about things like that but uh, much later, you know, a few years later when I met other people, I I did have those friends that could tell me about things. But I just kind of had to wait until I heard it on the radio by chance. And I didn't know anything about hardcore. Like I guess that I got in the Sex Pistols in 1980 after they'd been broken up for two years. And it probably wasn't until 1982 or so that I was listening to a college station that I could pick up from nearby. And I think I heard either Black Flag or the Dead Kennedys. And once again, it was another one of these moments where it seemed like up until then, really what I've been listening to is British punk. 
And when I heard Black Flag, it, it really seemed to me like these are people that are more like me, like people who grew up liking metal, Black Sabbath and all that kind of stuff. But it just wasn't raw enough for them and they infused it with something else. So that was in it. Then once I found out about hardcore, I became obsessed with that and kind of tried to gather as many records as I could. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. The first, um, the tape that you, yeah, Porn Orchard put out is definitely kind of in the hardcore vein. Yeah. Like a My War era Black Flag kind of. Right. Yeah. People yeah. have that. That's probably my fault. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So um, then how'd you get to Athens? My friend Ted, who's the, the singer and the bass player in Corn Orchard, mm -hmm. he grew up nearby where I did. I, these days I say that we grew up together, but we, I don't think I met Ted until I was 16 or so, maybe 17. Uh, there was a, a college town nearby where I grew up, like 10 miles away. That a lot of the people and a lot of the kids my age were different from the kids that I grew up with. My town was really small and pretty industrial. And this town called Potsdam had a couple colleges there and people were just a little bit different, you know? Uh, and I met Ted in Potsdam. He actually worked at a record store and he would order me Black Flag uh, records and nice. Kennedy's records and stuff like that. Uh, and so I became friends with him in Potsdam and it was just really simple. We spent some time together in Potsdam, played some music mainly just kind of goofed around and did nothing, you know, listen to music. Uh, he moved to Athens in 1980, the spring of 85, because his sister was down here in school and he just needed to get out of upstate New York. Uh, he left and I didn't think that I would be moving here until he came back about six months later and said, excuse me, he came into where I was working. It was a video arcade in the Miss Pac-Man era. Like all of us working in this video in this video arcade. And I said, How's Athens? And he said, It's great. We have a house, we have a room in our house opening up for $75 a month. And I said, I'm moving to Athens. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was really all the that was it. I just That's knew so that, cool. uh, I knew about REM and all that. Uh, cool. I had other friends that I'd met in that town in Potsdam. This band called the Gigolo Ants, with these guys would later become the Gigolo Ants, uh, that I became friends with, and they were they loved REM, and so I knew what Athens was. I knew there was music here, and since Ted had moved down here, and there was a room opening up for seventy five bucks, that that would man, that was it, you know. Totally, that's a good deal. That's so nice. So I guess you moved here, kind of. If you've ever seen that Inside Out documentary, I guess you kind of moved here around that time. I moved here when they were filming it. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, we weren't together yet. I moved here in November 85, and uh, I think they filmed that winter. I think they filmed like December, January. Uh, we had actually played one gig in December of 85, just like a month after I moved here. But it, what we had the name already, but we were we had the chance to open for a, a band here, so we just got on stage and just made noise. and. We, I, <laughs> had any songs but it was just uh we just did it and we may have had one or two songs and that was it cool that's awesome nice so you're speaking of the name how did you guys come up with that that's a i think that's a great name thank you uh ted had the idea for a an, band called bone orchard and i knew i don't think i ever heard the band but i knew that there was another band called bone, bone orchard and so i mentioned that and I don't, I can't remember who came up, who changed that to porn, the porn or not. It was probably Ted. It sounded like something he would have come up with. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So y'all were like 18 when you formed around then? 20. 20. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Ted and I were both 20, and Sam's a few years older than us. So Sam may have been 22. Uh, and we had a fourth member at the beginning. I don't know if uh, you say you heard that first tape. I don't know if you'd seen the yeah. liner notes for it, but we had another. Ted was just the singer at that point. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, another guy named Ron Hargrove who was playing bass. And he was, I think he was a couple years older than me. None of us were older than 22, but Ted and I were both 20. Cool. That's awesome. Were you all into similar music or were there different tastes kind of? It was very different tastes. 
Ted, Ted liked all kinds of different stuff. I, Ted was a, a fantastic musician, maybe one of the best I've ever known. And I've noticed this phenomenon with really great musicians that they're not necessarily, they like everything, but they're not really fans of anything. You know, they're just kind of into music as an experience more than they are the different bands. So Ted's, Ted was like that. His interests were really wide ranging. Sam uh, had played bass in a country and Western band. Uh, and he had played in like a, a pop band here in Athens called Du Blanton. And Ron had played in a pop band here too. And none of them were really under, knew about the things that I was interested in necessarily. I would talk about it all the time, but uh, hardcore and, you know, underground music and things like that. But uh, we all just had completely different interests musically, uh, cool. which is good, you know, because it makes, you know, the end result, the music you make together, it's just more varied. If, For sure. Yeah, if everybody gets into a band, not to say there aren't ba good bands that result from this, but say you get into a band with four other people and everybody's into Black Sabbath. You know what that band's going to sound like. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Not much variety there. <laughs> yeah, but so that can be good, but we just, you know, mainly it was we all started playing together because we all lived together. When I moved to Athens, I moved into a house with Ted and Sam and another guy named Larry, uh, who I've known since that time. He's played in a bunch of bands around here. And Ron was just coming over all the time to, we had a practice room just to jam. And so we, at that point, I wasn't trying to say, let's put a band together, even though the, you know that's what I wanted to do eventually. But we were just playing with whoever was at hand and that's how the, that's kind of how the band started. It's awesome, cool. How long did y'all uh, play until you recorded the actual tape? That's interesting that you asked that because I was thinking about this a couple weeks ago. I know that we recorded two songs initially and that would have been in the spring of 1986. And sometimes on the internet, on YouTube, I've noticed that people who upload that music will upload that tape that you're talking about mm -hmm. and these other two songs. And those songs are way to change the way you feel. And the other song is our band. Okay. Yeah. Those were on the one. Yeah, I was people combine those. Yeah. I've noticed, I've noticed that happens. So way to change and our band were recorded in the spring of 86. And we just did that at home. Uh, Cause Ted and I both had these Fostex X 15 four track cassette recorders. We both have the same. We bought them in the same shop in Potsdam, New York, before we moved down here. And I, I forget how we did it, but we somehow ran them together, patched them together, and we had an eight-track, a de facto eight-track. Awesome. <laughs> if you ask me how, like how we did that, if you could have shown me today how that was done, I, I have no idea how to tell you how we did it. But we did it. And uh, I'll never forget that for some reason – we also ran every single thing that we did, the drums, the bass, the guitar, and the vocals, through a little Ibanez uh, pedal compressor. <laughs> so, again, I don't know why. It, I guess it just sounded good to us at the time. But listening back to that recording, I love the way it sounds. It sounds really small in a way, but it just jumps out of the speakers at you. Totally, yeah. You know, it doesn't sound, sometimes things can sound so big that they're not distinct anymore. And that, those two songs don't have that problem. They, they sound small, but they sound clear as a bell. So mm -hmm. I guess we did the right thing. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Yeah. And that tape that you're talking about, uh, uh, Hit the Right People Hard, that was recorded, I think, about a year later in spring of 1987, we went to Snellville either Snellville or Loganville. And we knew someone down there, down here, down there at a studio. That's awesome. Yeah. We recorded cool. then. Nice. Yeah. I think it was, um, mile nine studios in Snellville. That's right. Jeb that's Logan. Cool. That's awesome. So it was an actual like studio or was it kind of like a converted garage for like 
local bands to record in? Uh, it was an actual studio, but it, it was fairly low budget. I think it was just a 16 track. And it was just in this guy's bedroom, but it was pretty, it's Jeb from a, Jeb from the Coolies. Uh, he was uh, he was in this band called the Coolies, and he was just a real talented engineer. And I think they recorded all their stuff at home. I have no idea how we hooked up with Jeb. It may have been maybe just somebody here in town. Maybe the guys in Mercyland had recorded with him or something like that. But it was a real studio, and uh, yeah, I think we recorded it all in one day. That's awesome. Nice, cool. And then um, it was a couple years before y'all released Urges and Angers, but in between that time, y'all put out a couple seven inches and then an EP. So, yeah, we well actually we put out another tape called uh, Keep That Pretty Smile. It was just another five song demo tape, cool. and that was the last thing we did with Ron. We had done a couple tours at that point, and Ron was just ready to move on. We for whatever reason we practiced all the time uh we would at that stage we would practice like five days a week because you know we all live together so except for ron so i think for ron just coming having to come over a lot of people get in a band and they don't count on practicing five days a week nor do they want to yeah <laughs> so it's just i think it would just in the end wasn't for him and he just i think he wanted to move from athens anyway uh so then we got ted uh Ted hadn't been playing an instrument up until this point. And like I said, Ted is one of the best musicians I've ever known. And so Ron left the band and then we just became a three piece. Uh, and we practiced for a couple months with Ted as the bass player and singer. And then we played a few gigs and we recorded that uh, seven inch. Cool. Yeah. And side a chain delivery is a, a song that we, wrote while ted was the bass player so that was a new song and the other two songs on the other side were songs that we'd had for a couple of years okay awesome nice yeah. so you think becoming a three-piece kind of maybe changed your sound a bit i mean kind of like had to change things up a bit yeah we got a lot better uh it was fun being a four-piece and it was fun just having ted sing just be it was this kind of chaotic element to everything mm -hmm. uh but i think we just we were a lot better musically after Ted came along. Uh, just because I said uh, Ted Ted was just a great guitar player, he was a great bass player, and we were able to really kind of dig into the music a little more uh, than we were when Ron was playing with us. Um, and at that point, we just we practiced a lot. Everybody was really excited. Ted was excited about playing bass, and we just we probably played more than we should have. We probably probably more than we should have. But. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. So during this time, were any new bands kind of like influencing you guys? Because the, the sound between um, Hit the Right People Hard and Urges and Angers is kind of like a shift sound slightly, like less out of the hardcore, more to kind of like your own. Yeah, people. some people say at that point we became a prog rock band. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, there were, uh, well, speaking for myself, I was kind of getting into different bands. And a lot of the, the bands that I was getting into at the, uh, after that point, I was kind of getting out of the whole hardcore thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really like this anymore, but at that time, if you ran into someone who was over the age of 21 that was really into hardcore, it just some, kind of seemed odd. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like... I, that might sound funny to say, but at the time, that's the way it was. It was kind of a thing for if you were in high school and just after high school. But uh, not to say that it was bad music or anything like that, but it was just kind of like a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. more than something you would stick with for a long time. Interesting. Uh, and uh, I know it's not like that anymore, but... Uh, I, the, well, the bands that I was listening to were a lot of local bands. I again i was thinking about this the other day and that after i moved out of my parents house and moved down here i really didn't have much money to collect or buy records and so the bands that i listened to were mainly bands that i knew that were giving me 
their seven inches or cassette tapes or whatever. And so I got really into local band bands here in town, like Barbecue Killers and Mercy Land yeah. and all that kind of stuff. It was fairly incestuous for a little bit. Uh, just going to see all those bands all the time and being influenced by things that your friends were doing. Yeah. Uh, and so that was really exciting because each month or each month and a half when they would play, you knew they would have new stuff and it was kind of, it would make you want to go home and practice. It would make you want to go home and write songs, like sing great stuff on your friends, do great stuff on stage. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Yeah. You're talking about barbecue killers and, um, I guess uh, Laura's next band, Jacker Nuts, is like the only band that I would compare Corn Orchard to musically. Do you think that's kind of like accurate? Yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> the Jack and Nuts were a three piece at the time. And uh, I know that uh, the guys in the Jack and Nuts and me and everyone, the other guys in Porn Orchard, were really into kind of that first wave of SST bands. Mm -hmm. And Black Flag was included in that, but it was, I don't know how much you know about it, but it was really varied. And as up through the, like, the late 80s, it got really varied. Me Puppets and Men and Men at Easter Do and all those bands. It was kind of a thing. Uh, and I know the Jackanuts really loved SST stuff. And I did too. And so I can see that maybe there was a, a something similar there, like influence-wise it was going on. That's cool. Nice. Awesome. So at this point, I guess early 90s, what would you kind of classify Porn Orchard Sound as? Or is there anything that you would really call it? As boring as it sounds, <laughs> I'm going to just call it rock. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it's uh, it's got some noise elements. Uh, and it, it definitely doesn't sound like 70s guitar rock because it's not bluesy. Yeah. Uh, and it's got some influence from hardcore, just the energy, the, like the basic energy of it. But like I said, you, Sam and Ted, you know, they were aware of hardcore and they would definitely hear me listening to it. But it wasn't the kind of thing that they ever listened to. So they were bringing their thing into it. Uh, people say that we sound like King Crimson. You know, if that's true, like, the King Crimson record red. Yeah. If people really believe that, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Because I think that's a great record, but I can see there's some proggy elements because we weren't concerned about writing a three minute pop song. Mm -hmm. We we were never looking at the clock and saying, uh oh, it's you know four minutes long, we have to end this. Mm -hmm. We were just when we were composing songs, we would uh write that song until we were satisfied. And when we were done, if it turned out to be a seven minute song, that's just the way it was. Awesome. And if it was two minutes, that's just the way it was too. So we were just kind of doing what we kind of doing what we we're feeling to be the right thing. Cool. Nice. So then how'd you hook up with uh, Daniel house and get on the CZ label then? It's interesting because I met you a couple of weeks ago in the grit because you were wearing a skin yard t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for everybody listening at home, if you don't know, that was Daniel House's band. Uh, and I was at a club or something, and I was wearing a Melvin's t-shirt. Nice. And But there were very few people that knew about the Melvin's at the time. And the Melvin's didn't even have t-shirts for sale. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Larry, who is who was in Waylaid and uh, Magneto and all those bands, he worked at a screen printing place and we just loved the first Melvin's record, Gluey Porch yeah. Treatments. So he made a bunch of Melvin's t-shirts. We weren't selling them or anything, but he just made them for me and our friends. That's we awesome. All, we all love that record. Mm -hmm. I was wearing a Melvin's t-shirt and the guys from Skin Yard just came out of the woods <laughs> next to this club. And I'd heard of Skin Yard, but I didn't know any of them. Uh, and one of these guys, one of the members of the band came up and looked at me, kind of got in my face and was like, a Melvin's t-shirt. They're on my label. <laughs> I don't think they have t-shirts, do they? And I thought like I was busted. You know? <laughs> but that, yeah. was, that was Daniel House. That's awesome. And, uh, nice. 
he said, we, we hung out for a few minutes and we were talking and he found out I was in Porn Orchard and he had, uh, we put out that seven inch like the year before and he had that seven inch. Oh, no way. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. So he knew about us. And uh, I went to the gig that night and saw Skin Yard. I thought they were great. And we just kind of kept in touch. And I don't know how long after that. He, it seemed like he was just kind of getting uh, CZ up and running. He had done some stuff, but he was there. I think the connection might be breaking up real quick. Let's see. All right. There you go. I'm getting kind of a flashing blue thing. Does that mean the audio? Right. Can no, I think that's the internet connection might be going. Um, all right. I think it's all good now, though, for me. Is it good? Yeah. Cool. All right. So you're saying uh, Daniel House is talking to him? Yeah, I think he was at that moment. He was just getting CZ up. It had been going for a few years. But I think he was just kind of getting it up into a kind of a full time operation. Cool. And he was looking for bands. And we just kept in touch. And it may have been a year later that uh, right. he was like, Yeah, put out some records with us. And so I think he, uh, three, I think he contracted with us to do three records, and one of which, excuse me was the ep that we put out in the meantime cool. that heart, brain raw mm -hmm. so when our first record on cz came out the cd copy of it also contained heart and brain raw and that was included in the three right i think i'm remembering this correctly that would have been included in the three records that we were doing with cz okay nice that's awesome cool but you don't the the vinyl version obviously is just urges and urges and angers yeah Cool, nice. So I guess, do you remember where Skinner are playing at the 40 watt that night that you saw them? I think they were playing at a place called the Rockfish Palace. Rockfish Palace, okay. And that, do you know where the Classic Center is? Yeah. Uh, there were there were a bunch of things before they mowed it down to make the Classic Center. There was a, a fish market there and there was a pottery studio and there was also a club. This is, got, this is probably 1990. There's a club called the Rockfish Palace. It was right over there. Awesome. Cool. That's sweet. Yeah. So I guess that would have been kind of before they broke up, I think, in 1991. So I don't remember last year. Yeah. Because they put out a record in 1993, but Daniel told me that that was like they'd already broken up by then. And he'd already been out of the band for a while, I think. Yeah, maybe I remember that. Because Hollowed Ground was, was that maybe the last one that he was on. Uh, no, I think a thousand smiling knuckles might have been okay. the last one he was on. Yeah. Okay. I didn't realize they broke up quite that early, but yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. So, um, were there any other bands? I know I mentioned Jack or Nuts, but any other bands in Athens kind of like influenced by you guys that were doing similar music at this time too? Uh, there, there were a bunch of bands that we were friends with that started up that we would play with. I don't know how much they were influenced by us, but they were friends of ours and we would play gigs together. There was a, a Magneto, a, my friend Larry and a Tony and Frank were in that band. And before I forget, my friend Frank McDonald is a great guitar player and he played some in the glands. And he's a, he also has a new thing that he's doing called Trico. I'll probably screw up the spelling, even though I put it on Spotify for him. It's T R Y C O H. Okay. And it's all instrumental and it's, it's just been uploaded to Spotify. It's fantastic. He's a, cool. um, he's an idol of mine and a good friend of mine. He's a great guitar player. Awesome. There was also a band called Waylaid that were pretty heavy. Uh, I'm going to forget somebody. Uh, Slumberjack and a clamp were great. Uh, and, you probably heard of Harvey Milk. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Harvey Milk came along maybe a year, maybe around 1992 or something like that. And they were just phenomenal. I mean, they just kind of, they changed a lot of things for the people who go to see Harvey Milk and they were just. <laughs> yeah. And they kind of put, uh, we've been playing for a few years and they just, Harvey Milk really kind of upped the ante for heavy music. That's awesome. That's yeah. so cool. Nice. Cool. Well, I should have asked this earlier, but how um, did you guys write songs? Uh, there were very few of our songs where 
one of us would write the music and the words and come in and say, look what I have, here's how it goes. I think of all the songs that we ever had, there was probably a grand total of five or less where that happened. Uh, yeah. And not that we discouraged that or anything, it just, it just didn't happen that way that often. Uh, most of the time, I would come in with a riff and I used to, I used to just practice guitar all the time and play and play and play until I heard something that sounded like something that I liked, that sounded unique enough and cool enough that just kind of, you know, it's like the church, they, these days they call it the church of the riff. Yeah. You know, like you hear a great riff and you know it and everybody mm -hmm. else knows it. And so I would sit and play guitar until I thought that I had something and then bring it to the band very bare bones yeah maybe not even a structure but maybe just a riff idea and we cool. would go from there and then also lots of times too we would practice and just kind of freeform play and we had a cassette recorder that when somebody heard something that they liked it would just go over and press record on the on the cassette recorder so we would remember it and so sometimes unless we had a gig coming up that we would maybe just want to run a set for mm -hmm. we're playing in two days at the 40 watt or going on tour, let's run the set four times over the next few days and just blow through it. Uh, so unless we had to do that, we would just go in there and just kind of bullshit, kind of make things up, sometimes not be serious, mm -hmm. play cover songs to the extent that we, knew any of that we could play together cool make fun of other songs that we had heard and <laughs> just kind of yeah i don't know what you call it just free yeah. fun. and then we would hear something that made us get serious and we'd write a song mm -hmm. there <laughs> that's awesome yeah it's really cool nice well you mentioned you guys go on tour um how often or how many tours did y'all go on and where did you go we did a lot it got to the point that well, the first thing that we did was in the summer of 1987. We had put out that Hit the Right People Hard demo. And we went on tour for three and a half weeks on the back of a demo tape that nobody heard and nobody had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a great chance to travel. Mm -hmm. And have you heard of the magazine Maximum Rock and Roll? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as you can say about that magazine where it was just kind of, this is kind of aimed at high school kids arguing at what punk rock is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. It's something that you may have grown out of when you were 16. One great thing about that magazine is they had uh, scene reports from other states and other towns. Okay. Also with phone numbers of people that would set shows up and mailing addresses and club names and club addresses and club phone numbers. And so I did 99% of the booking for Porn Orchard wow. until we got with CZ and then CZ had an in-house booker. So I did all the booking from 1987 and until 1991 or 1992. Cool. And I got all that going from the back of Maxim Rock and Roll. That's awesome. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. We're going to South Carolina, find the scene report from South Carolina, all of the people in Clemson, Columbia and Charleston, piece something together and up and down the coast. And that's how we did it. And after a couple of years of doing that, we knew enough people that we could just kind of go back to the same places. Uh, and <clears throat> from 1987 until we broke up in uh, December of 1992, we basically did a tour every season of the year, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And those tours were anywhere from about two and a half weeks to three and a half weeks long. So we did give or take about 12 weeks of touring a year in bits and pieces, not counting like long weekends and mm -hmm one-off dates where we would just drive 
to somewhere ridiculous like Raleigh and play one show and drive back. back Jeez, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> a lot of that, a lot of uh, overnight stuff. For, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody was going to give us $500, we would drive to Virginia Beach. and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it was more money than we had ever seen. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. So we did a lot of touring, but we were never uh, – uh, once CZ started booking us, we did some longer ones than that. I think in the summer of spring and summer of 1992, I think we did it one that CZ booked where we got out into the Midwest and to uh, out to the Mississippi. That was, I think it was like six weeks long or something like that. Cool. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, we just, we did, but we did smaller chunks. So we weren't, we were never going to quit our jobs and just go on the road. It just would have, it would have been ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. That's hilarious. Cool. So um, you guys are also on the teriyaki asthma compilation with uh, gas huffer, Jonestown and daddy hate box. I think is the volume five of that series. That sounds right. It's got a picture cool. of a guy on a donkey on the front. Like a yeah. Donkey. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I've got the, uh, I got the CD with like the first five, I guess on there, but, um, Oh yeah. He's got like a lot of cool, like Helios Creed, Alice Donut, Nirvana, L7. Um, what was it like being on a compilation with like, you know, some pretty big bands like that? Uh, it, it gave you something to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, and if you could mention to your parents that you were on a CD with Nirvana, they were immediately depressed. Because yeah. they, you know, older people had heard of Nirvana, so it was a way to kind of justify what you were doing. <laughs> but we might go through that too. The guys in Helios Creed, I remember, came mm -hmm. through Athens. And uh, we, a after that comp came out, and so we hung out with those guys. And I think we played that gig too. Okay. Uh, awesome. it, it was neat being on a, a compilation with with bands that I really admired that mm -hmm. that I didn't know and maybe had gotten to know through that. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. And then let's see. After that, um, I actually had the CD for Name Your Regions. Um, this came out in 1993, right? Uh, it came out I think in June of '93. June '93. So you said you guys broke up in December 1992, though. That's right. We had already had that recorded. We recorded it with Dave Barbie from Mercyland in. I think it was that fall, maybe September, October, something like that. Yeah. And then we broke up just before Christmas of that year. And that CD came out in June of, of 93. That picture on the inside cover. Yeah. Where we're standing on the porch and there's that skeleton behind mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That, Let's see. Uh, that's a friend of ours house. Oh, really? Yeah. And that was in Athens. In Athens, it's over on Grady Street. She doesn't live there anymore, but uh, that skeleton, uh, it was a New Year's Day uh, decoration that she had put up. Oh, yeah. That picture was taken after we had broken up. That one. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. That's and cool. That was New Year's Day, and so that's why she had that skeleton yeah. on the front porch. Oh, nice. That's hilarious. So we had been broken up for three weeks by that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember that picture. Wow, that's cool. Nice. Do you know who that picture is then? Yeah. Uh... Deanna Mann. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Do you know Deanna? I do not know. She was in the, oh, another band I forgot to mention named Crack. Crack? <laughs> yeah. Cool. My good friend, right. Rick Danziel, and Joel from Mercyland played drums in that band before he was in Mercyland. And I'm trying to think of who else is in the band. But anyway, Deanna was the singer, and she was just this, she's still around town. She lived in New York for a long time, but she's back now. Mm -hmm. She was just this local, I don't know how to describe Dion, a performance artist, yeah. a personality, bigger than the sun personality. Uh, mm -hmm. And she sang, she was a singer for Crack. And that was at one of our gigs. Yeah. Uh, before we went on stage, she brought a stuffed animal on stage <laughs> and stabbed it to death with a kitchen knife. Is that's, that when all that fluff is in the air? Yeah, that's her murdering. That's, cool. huge stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. Nice. Cool. Well, um, out of the two full lengths you put out, I guess not including the um, Hit the Right People Hard demo, what, um, what was like, did you, do you have a favorite of the two or do you listen to one more than the other ever? The two full lengths on CZ? Yeah. I, I don't know that I would have a favorite. I know that uh, 
the the first ep i always think the first ep that we put out mm -hmm. uh, as a three-piece heart and brain raw mm -hmm. to me that just sounds like that's a perfect ep I, re I really like the way that came out i love the songs i love the way it was recorded and we just went in and, and blew it out and in, in one day oh, nice and so that came out great urges and angers is more varied and i think the songs the songs are more varied and the songs maybe are more interesting in some ways uh uh, that almost seems like a, a song record, whereas the first EP is kind of all energy, you know? Yeah. And the uh, <clears throat> Namie Regions we recorded with Dave Barbie, and he was real, and we had a budget. Uh, CZ gave us a budget of $2,500. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like we had a million dollars when we went in because yeah. the rest of our records were recorded for like six or seven or $800 or something. <laughs> That's so awesome. With twenty five hundred dollars, like holy, what are we going to do with all this money? You know, like yeah, for sure. And David was David's great, and uh, he he was really into kind of stretching out and there's a bunch of sound effects on that record. If you listen closely, uh, at the beginning of Robot Love, Liar Machine, yeah, there's some kids. You can hear kids on a playground. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah and there's other things that are buried, like the just before the guitar solo in the song need to bleed there's a the something that sounds like air raid sirens kind of in the background mm -hmm. it goes and what that is is a david barbie with a turntable running it backwards slowly and then speeding it up oh no way that's awesome yeah wow. mixing it into that right that's david uh and so I thought that sounded great. And there's Yeah, totally. And also in that song, near the end of it, I don't it's kind of hard to hear, but when the riff changes right at the end of that song, Robot Love Liar Machine, mm -hmm. it kind of gets grindy and kind of shreddy sounding. And we actually made a mic really hot and ripped pieces of paper. So <laughs> Oh really? No way, that's crazy. So this piece, it doesn't sound like paper being ripped up, but it has this weird shreddy quality. No, no, yeah, that's awesome. I didn't know that. That's really cool. And Maybe uh, that was some like sampling or something. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really that record's really neat that way. Yeah. And also the song itself, "Name Your Regions," is a mm -hmm. kind of like a soundscape. Yeah, yeah. And like a seven uh, minute track, I think, or five, six minutes, yeah. something like that. Yeah. That's just stuff we got off the radio and stuff we got from records and kind of mixing it in and the all that backwards stuff that you can hear mm -hmm. uh the backwards voices and the backwards music is all the that's all taken from the song dcrw that's on urges and angers oh yeah so we just got the old tape out and ran it all backwards and put soundscapes on that <laughs> no way that's awesome that's yeah so cool. it, it was really you know that uh the the clash record sandinista mm -hmm. they did they had a one side of that record is them just kind of like screwing around with their old songs and running about yeah. and stuff and i'm like so i just want i want i always wanted to do something like that and the kind mm -hmm. of the beatles thing too where they just do a bunch of mm -hmm. references to their old songs and backwards things so that's awesome cool yeah that's what all yeah, that man. is it's one of our old songs <laughs> oh that's awesome cool nice yeah um is there like a favorite song that you came out with like a riff on any of the albums it's like you just you loved how you wrote that one the song that's on our single and it was also on a uh, heart and brain rock the chain delivery i think is just recorded perfectly yeah uh i love the it's a great riff. I think we were really feeling it when we recorded it, just the the vibe and the tempo and everything. And just, I don't think we could have recorded it any better. Yeah. I think it's a great song. The choices that we made in recording, the like doubling the guitars in certain points and the double vocals that Ted did, it just, I don't think there's a producer on earth that could have been brought in to have us do a better version of that. <laughs> cool, that's awesome. And and a lot of DCRW is a great song. I love Ted's vocals on it. 
Yeah. Uh, what's the what plays Flame is a is a great one. Ted, I just love what Ted did with that song singing mm -hmm. wise. Yeah. Uh, Ted was an interesting singer. He never thought he was any good. Really. Uh, but I thought he was fantastic. Uh, he just had this. He always said, "Well, my voice isn't for everyone, and, and that's for sure." But nobody's is. Yeah, you know? that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, but he just had this real emotive kind of emotional quality to his voice. I, I mean, he really meant it. He, there was no. Ted didn't have a facade. You know, he was never acting. You know, when he was singing, he just mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't a. Uh, conceited about it but he the things he sang about and the way he sang it was just very very honest cool and uh, i'm really glad that we got him to uh to sing and to play bass he wasn't a singer before we started playing really he had never done it no he uh he was kind of a guitar hero in our hometown cool uh he was a great guitar player uh he was better than i was you know he taught me there's a way that he played chords that just kind of blew my mind. And I just kind of picked up and stole from him. Really kind of splashy. Mm -hmm. Do you play an instrument? Uh, yeah, I do drums, guitar, bass. Oh yeah. Do you know what, uh, what people call a power chord is just a root of fifth and then the octave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we went with that, with the way that Ted would do it but he would also leave the other strings, the G string, the B string, and the E string ringing. Oh, really? Where you were, you can't apply it all the time. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Yeah. It has a really cool kind of noisy quality. For sure. You know, at times, depending on what position you're in, if you just leave those strings ringing, move to another place and leave those same strings ringing, theoretically it doesn't work, but man, it's awesome. Totally, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Nice. Jimmy Page did some of that. I think Ted may have got it from Jimmy Page. But anyway, he was the first person I saw do that. And I'm like, okay, I'm mm -hmm. still on that. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> nice. Did you um did you know who his guitar influences were? Like his favorite guitarists? When I met him, he loved uh kind of later or would have been at the would have been at the time current King Crimson. Okay. People like Adrian Ballou. Uh and Ted had a guitar synthesizer. Really? When I met him. And I kind of, I would tease him about it because I kind of turned up my nose. Oh, guitar synthesizer. Why do you know? Come yeah. on, you know. Just plug that thing straight into an amplifier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he liked all that stuff, and he was great with it. He was he was really innovative with it. But Ted played in cover bands, uh, which is something that I never really did. Mm -hmm. During high school, just me and my friends were, trying to write our own stuff, not successfully, but trying. Yeah. During that, you know, Ted and I were the same age. And when I was doing that, Ted was playing in cover bands and he was learning a lot. Uh, uh, he was just learning a lot of different styles, like different styles. Cool. So he was, he knew all that Zeppelin stuff and he knew, you know, the cover bands at the time and yeah, all that kind of thing. So he awesome. Like I said about Ted, his influence were kind of wide ranging. He wasn't into the personalities. He wasn't really interested in the personalities of people in bands. He was just interested in the music. You think that's really cool? Nice, yeah. the just real quality of it. Cool, nice. So y'all remained amicable after you you broke up? Oh yeah, we stayed friends. Cool, yeah. that's awesome. We uh, still hung out a lot and played some here and there. Yeah. Uh, and Ted went on to play in the Germans and they put out one single, which is something you probably can't. I'd be surprised you could find that any place. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Sam played in the Sunshine Fix, which is a uh, bill from Olivia Tremor Control, uh, his band after the Sunshine Fix. And Sam and I actually went on to play with Vic Chestnut for about 10 years. Really cool. Yeah. Uh, when I say 10 years, nobody played with Vic Chestnut all the time for any stretch of time. Yeah. But we, would, but we did a lot of touring with him, and we actually played on the Craig Kilburn show on CBS. Oh, really? No way. Yeah, and we, we did a bunch of touring with and played on some Vic records. So 
I'd say on and off Santa. I played with Vic for about 10 years. Cool. That's awesome. So why did uh, Paul and Orchard break up then? Well, uh, the short, I think the short answer is that we had already been together for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And as much fun as it was, it was really hard. And it seemed like it was getting to the point that we were just going to have to do. Ted Ted left the band. Yeah. yeah, that's the short answer. He just wanted to get into some other stuff. He wanted to get into uh, cooking, and he wanted to. I think he he wanted to play some other kinds of music. Uh -huh. And the other thing is that we had been together for seven years at that point, and we still weren't. You know, we weren't seeing any money. Mm -hmm. didn't expect to that's not why we got into it but yeah. after seven years of getting in the van and going out and coming back and being you know a little bit in debt and having to work that off yeah it kind of by the time you're like 27 28 years old it, it starts to get to you a little bit <laughs> yeah i can imagine for sure yeah so i was reading a bit about ted online um did he form or he started the grit or he just managed it for a while uh, Ted, the, the grit started this woman named Jennifer Hartley, who's still in town okay. and Jessica, who was then Ted's girlfriend and then became his wife, mm -hmm. Jessica and Jenna, uh, bought it from Jennifer and they ran it for a couple of years. And then Ted started managing it right around that time, you know, maybe a year or so before the band broke up. And then Jenna wanted out of it. And so Jessica bought her out. And by that time, uh, Jessica and Ted were married. And so he kind of became part owner of the grit. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you start working there soon after? Or is... I started working there, I think. I've worked there on and off since around 2000. Okay. And I, all the time that I played with Vic, I worked there. So I'd go off on tour and just kind of come back to town and and work there again just kind of that might be the last job in town that's kind of a run like the old days yeah where you could go off we could work someplace and then go off and play a tour for a month and come mm -hmm. back and not only get your job back but you get your actual shifts back oh, okay wow that's awesome <laughs> Man, i need to apply there <laughs> right. so right uh, and Ted and Ted died. I don't know if you had, how much you read about it. Ted died in yeah. uh, 2007. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, he had gotten really sick. And uh, but up until that point, he had. Uh, I've I've always wanted to do this. He was in a band called Six String Fever that he wrote all the songs. Oh, cool! And the rhythm section in that band uh, are the guys from Harvey Milk. Steve. Oh no way! Really? Yeah. Oh awesome. man! Great. I nobody's put it online and I have a cassette that's kind of been sitting in my drawer mm -hmm. and every now and then I pick it up and look at it. I'm like, man, I need to put this on CD before it turns to a glue, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Man, it is a fantastic record. It's awesome. And Creston, the guitar player from Harvey Milk plays drums on it. And Steven uh, Tanner plays bass. Okay, cool. Um, nice. Edward's just a great songwriter here. And it was really cool to see him go from just kind of guitar star from when we were kids mm -hmm. to singing in porn orchard and then after porn orchard singing and playing guitar yeah yeah that's really cool yeah and great stuff six string fever i promise i'm going to try to get that online yeah that would be awesome to hear nice cool maybe you should get in contact with the uh henry owings i think the chunklet guy who uh puts out like local music like reissues and stuff right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, he might be interested in doing that for sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Well, I don't know. Are you um, are you still doing music these days? Uh, I'm up until the pandemic. Uh, after Vic died, I started. Uh, I'd been getting into like acoustic music more. Cool. And even we played electric with Vic a lot, but we'd also play acoustic some. Okay. And, even while I was playing with Vic, I started to get into bluegrass and old time music. And so that's like, sort of like starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. 
I've had to learn a lot more about the guitar. I had to kind of change the way that I held the guitar yeah, and ho hold the pick to be able to play that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started playing with these guys that uh, in this kind of bluegrass circle. But everybody involved in that were older than me, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, all, they all knew. I knew 80 songs after playing with those guys. They know 800. Mm -hmm. but, wow. but the point is, is that uh, when COVID happened, they took it really seriously because, you know, they're all 10 years older than me. Yeah. And so that that bluegrass mm -hmm. circle that I was kind of and it was very informal. We played some weddings and stuff like that. But generally, we just got together on Thursday night and learned songs and just kind cool. of did it. So that's all kind of splintered. Yeah. And I don't know when that's going to come back together, if ever. But I've really been thinking about maybe playing electric again. That'd be awesome. Very cool. Uh, and just it's just an idea that I have that mm -hmm. I've noticed when I because I play a lot of guitar I always have. I've played I've tried to play an hour a day my whole life. Cool. That's uh, awesome. If I've been able to, and I've usually been able to do it. Uh yeah. And lately now when I sit down, I rather than kind of like learning bluegrass songs or something like that, I start to make stuff up. So like no, maybe That's so cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll get a band together. I don't know. Totally, yeah. That'd be awesome. Nice. Yeah, it's an idea. <laughs> yeah cool were you ever uh trained in music theory or kind of like music's just something that comes to you naturally i wouldn't say it's natural i've had to work pretty hard at it mm -hmm. you can never really say because you've only got your own experience and you know how hard you've worked mm -hmm. and i think a natural tendency is to look at other people and think that it's easy for them yeah. but my but i've always had to work really hard and uh but I've always had an idea in my head of what I've wanted things to sound like. Cool. Uh, and as the years have gone by, I've gone out of my way to really try to learn music theory. And I've learned a lot. Nice. And I would say to anybody that thinks that it's going to corrupt what they're doing by learning music theory, or maybe that it's too hard not to think that way because it's just a tool. And, you'll be surprised how easy it is once you it's like a language it's hard at first and it seems like you can't apply it and it seems like you're putting your shoes on backwards and trying to run it'll be mm -hmm. really natural if you've never tried it yeah. but you get about a year into it or maybe even less depending on your ability to absorb things and it, it can really improve your playing and improve the way you think about things it'll just make your life a lot easier if you just learn some basic stuff Cool. Nice. Yeah, I need to do that. I've uh, always been kind of like, uh, that's like the math part of music, but yeah. It is like the math part of music. But the other thing that I'll say is you'll be surprised how much you already know. Okay, cool. You'll keep bumping into things like, I knew this already. I just didn't know what it was called. Cool. And I did this already. I just didn't know why. Interesting. Yeah. It's very yeah. insightful. Cool. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing that way. And it's, and you don't have to learn a lot. It's not like you have to be a monk. Mm -hmm. Putting in a monastery, just pouring over music theory for hours a day. Yeah. Just for your the things that you can use, you learn some basic stuff and you'll be surprised at how much you can apply it. Cool. That's awesome. Nice. All right. Well, I guess to uh, wrap up here, um, are there any new bands in Athens that you kind of like paid attention to at all? Or are you kind of know about the scene at all right now? Uh, well, that band that I was talking about, Trico, Frank McDonald's band. Um, and he was one, when I put the, I put the porn orchard stuff on, uh, Spotify about four months ago and my distro kid account allowed me to put up one other band and I put Trico up. Oh, nice. That's so, awesome. So I can see all the streams that they get. So if anybody mm -hmm. wants to, you, you make me very happy by listening to Trico on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> cool, dude. Um, awesome. A lot of the, let me think about that. I know the guys in New Madrid. I really like New Madrid a lot. Cool. Uh, I, I like I always like David Barbie stuff. He's still doing stuff, right. and I always like what he does. Uh, my friend Don Chambers is a very talented uh, songwriter singer. Sometimes he does solo stuff. Sometimes he does stuff with the band. I think he's fantastic. Cool. Uh, I'm kind of drawing a blank otherwise, but you know, an hour from now, I'll think of ten other people. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, my friend Brandon has plays with plays with a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the shut ups and bands like that are really fun to go see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a few, there's still a few things happening. People are just kind of getting their legs back after COVID, after thing, everything got yeah. shut down. So for sure. Nice, cool. Well, uh, do you still like living in Athens or do you think you'll ever move? I don't know. I've been here since 1985. <laughs> uh, it's not the town it used to be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. One thing that I'll say that's really different in, in terms of music, you used to be able to move here and you know we had a house that we practiced in mm -hmm. and i don't think i ever paid more than 150 dollars a month rent until 1998. Uh, yeah and that just doesn't exist anymore because we just lived in old houses mm -hmm. didn't have air conditioning they just had gas heaters we froze in the winter time and we baked in the summertime but we didn't have to work a whole lot and we were able to concentrate on music and uh, that just doesn't exist like it did you're paying real money to rent here and you really you people might not have the time or the money to really devote hours a day to music or maybe they do but people find a way to do it i'm sure but yeah it's just not the once once a lot of money moved into Athens, things changed. It, it cheap, yeah. Cheap living was over, you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's crazy how much everything costs here. Like, like an apartment split with like two other people. It's crazy. It, it is crazy. When I hear, I own my house now. I bought it in two thousand and three. I'm glad I. Oh, nice. So mm -hmm. when I hear people say, "Yeah, I paid nine hundred dollars for an apartment," I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's almost like that. Yeah. I just wow. think wages need to catch up with that, and it'll be okay. But right. Yep. Now, just. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they expect people to live if you're paying them. $10 yeah, an hour. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know. And then uh, going like grocery shopping these days, it's like, I mean, you buy like maybe a week's worth of food and it's like so much. It's, oh my gosh, it's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah. It's crazy. And we yeah. also have restaurant jobs too. So we always got a free meal at the end of the day. So yeah. for years, mm -hmm. it was just like almost free to our overhead was almost nothing. Yeah, that's but, cool. But your question about Athens, I really love Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, I love being outdoors. I love going fishing and it's close enough to, you know, real nature to do that. But it also has enough of a, it's like a small town with an urban population. Yeah. So you can get a little taste of a city by going downtown and you can kind of have a similar experience as if you were going to kind of like a cool club, like the same kind of experience you'd have in a city. So mm -hmm. So Athens got a little bit of everything, you know. Pretty sure, totally. Yeah, that's been my experience so far. It's awesome. So. How long have you How long have you lived here? Uh, well, I just moved here actually the start of this month, but I've been coming up up here for shows for the past couple of years. Oh, um, fantastic! Yeah, right. not for 2020, 21, but um, yeah. So yeah. I definitely like it so far. I like uh, being able to ride my bike to class and stuff, like being outdoors, but with that urban feel, like you were saying. So. Yeah, like I said, it's got a little bit of everything. Totally. Yeah. So walk out on your bike on the roads, man. Yeah, no, I know. I live right off North Avenue. That's crazy. I would never uh, bike. Oh, on you that live North Avenue? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just live a couple in on a uh, Till side. I live up First Street. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, awesome. so we're kind of neighbors. Yeah, cool. <laughs> For sure. Awesome. Well, um, is there anything that I missed that you want to like talk about Horn Orchard at all, or like a favorite show you guys played, or any crazy stories? Oh man, there's a ton of crazy stories. Let me think of a. Uh, uh, we played. Do you know corrosion of conformity? Oh yeah, early corrosion of yeah. Yeah, we played a lot with those guys, uh, and we got to know Mike, uh, Mike Dean, and we got to know all of them. But when Mike left COC in, I think like nineteen eighty seven or eighty eight or something like that. He moved to Atlanta <clears throat> and he started a new band with a, a Kip from Neon Christ. And Kip, uh, that was his nickname. His real name's William Duvall, and he sings for Alice in Chains now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's strange that he's just a singer because he's a fantastic guitar player. It's another oh, one of yeah. guys, you know, like yeah. one of these guitar players that you see and you're like, oh my God. And <laughs> now he's just the singer as far as I know. Yeah. He started this band with Kip from uh william and we played it was called final offering okay cool 
one of the best bands I've ever seen as far as just, you know, just an explosion of energy, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we played a, when we would play with them, it was just kind of like, you knew you had to be on your game because they were so good. Yeah, totally. But I remember one time we played in Savannah. Was it Savannah or Augusta? Must have been Savannah. It was Savannah. And we played at an, lots of times, and this may still happen, but we would play at bars that were just rented out. Mm -hmm. Usually, oftentimes by some high school kid that was trying to bring bands into town. Cool. We'd play at some old man bar that, You'd show up there to load in, and everybody was, you know, well, the age that I am now. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. Are you guys ready for this? You know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, kids would show up. And at at this particular show, it was near. I found out later it was near a marine base. Oh wow. And uh, Mike had a chip on his shoulder about the military, and they opened for us. And there was no stage. Uh, and while they were playing this, uh, they kept all these Marine guys were there and they kept running into the band and knocking over their equipment. And they'd yeah. have to set back up again and uh, start playing. And so Mike had just had it and he got on the mic and said, Hey, do you guys know what an oxymoron is? And oxymoron is two words that don't go together. And a good example of an oxymoron is a uh, military intelligence. <laughs> guys, just all these jarheads just jumped on him, and it was this pile of Marines. Oh my god! And they were boring our our equipment, mm -hmm. and so Ted and I were like, oh, you know, we ran over and started pulling these Marines mm -hmm. off Mike, and we couldn't see him, but it was like seven guys on him, and we got to the bottom of this pile of Marines. Yeah, and uh, Mike wasn't there. Really, <laughs> it was like a magic trick or something. Mm -hmm. And what he had done is, there are these big base bins uh, in the PA system, and he mm -hmm. was a little guy, and he had just gotten to this base bin and put his base in front of him, <laughs> and turtled himself in a way that they couldn't get him. That's awesome. And when he figured that out, we figured that out. He just sprang out of the base bin, and started the song. You know, just <laughs> like they just went into the next song, and yeah, and it was just one of those moments, and. Uh, they were just, you know, they couldn't catch them, you know, so it was great. Totally. And then when we played, so we were, we had to play next. And again, we weren't on the stage and this guy kept like kind of dancing around and kept hitting my uh, effects. I had a distortion box on the floor. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I have to stand up for these guys, for these guys, but this guy's on a hair trigger. Yeah. So he came close and like, stepped on my pedal again. And I grabbed him like, man, don't step on my stuff. You know, I got to play. <laughs> And he was yeah. like, okay. And so he stood next to me for the rest of the gig. And anytime anyone came toward me, he punched him. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. But they were all used to it, you know. Yeah, they, for sure. They, they they weren't harming anybody, but they, mm -hmm. they really tried to, to work Mike over. <laughs> but they <Cool>. were... <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. Well, I'll ask you real quick, what gear were you using then? Like guitars I and pedals and stuff? I started out in an Ibanez CN200. It was just a, a 70s Ibanez. Uh, that's kind of like a Les Paul light, but it's double cutaway. Oh, okay. I still have a I still have that guitar. It's a great guitar. Cool. I played Fender Twin, starting off, and then had a, a Marshall JMP. Okay. Watt, and then I went to a, I found an old high watt, a hundred watt from the 60s. That I still have that I bought in 1990, 90 or 91 for $400. It came into some shop new. Nobody had bought it. And this is, you know, it was new in 68 and just sat there. Wow. And so That's I awesome. used, yeah, Fender, then Marshall, and then a Hiwa. And after after about 1987, I used to use the Les Paul mm -hmm. and a rat distortion box, and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Never go wrong with a rat for sure. Never go wrong with a rat. I still have that. It was a, it was a, a rat rack mount that had two rats built into it. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's so cool. Wow. That's Added awesome. double that. But I never really used it. In the studio, we would kind of use subtle effects and things like that. But I never used any effects on the floor besides the distortion box. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's nice. it. Wow, cool.
So um, if Ted were around still, do you think you would ever kind of do some reunion shows with Porn Orchard? Probably. Oh, yeah. We definitely talked about it before he died, like a year or so before he died, yeah. when he was doing well. Because he got sick fast. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so we had talked about it a little bit, nothing seriously. But I think we, I'm sure we would have, because we're all friends and everything. Yeah, know? totally. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I just saw the uh, Bob Hay Squalls reunion show a couple nights ago, which is pretty cool. So. Oh, yeah, I heard they were doing yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I know those guys. I know Ken pretty well. Oh, really? Nice. That's yeah. awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to do this interview with me. It's uh, awesome to finally demystify some of the band I've been wanting to know about for a while. So Fantastic, Sully. I really enjoyed it. For sure. Awesome. Well, um, I guess any final words from you? Uh, go out and see some bands. Totally. And uh, yeah. listen to Trico and Porn Orchard on Spotify. Yeah, I know. Did y'all just recently upload the uh, Porn Orchard albums? I just saw that they had been up on streaming recently, I think. Yeah, they're all up as of about four months ago. Okay, awesome. We'll probably cool. upload some demo stuff as, as the months go by and just nice. for anyone who's interested. I'm kind of in charge of the legacy, so. Yeah, cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again, and uh, I'm sure I'll run into you at the Grit pretty soon. So. Absolutely. All right. Well, you have a good rest of your night, and uh, see you later. You too, Sully. Bye-bye. Cool. All right. Thanks.